We're just two days away from the Edmonton Oilers opening their 2021 regular season as I'm pleased to welcome in Jack Michaels and Bob Stoffer. Tony Barr here for the panel presented by Coventry Homes. Gentlemen, just two days away. We just started training camp last week. You guys have seen all the skates. Bob, what are the, some of the main takeaways for you? Well, I know a lot of the focus, Tony, in the offseason was the improved depth for the Edmonton Oilers forwards. But for me, despite the fact that the Oilers will not have Oscar Clefbaum this season, one of the surprises was the transition game. Like, you know, Caleb Jones has a wonderful opportunity. He's been paired with Adam Larson. Larson looks like he's got a, a little bit more quickness. Uh, Evan Bouchard's going to be pushing. There's no question about that. He's slimmed down 9 to 11 pounds. Uh, Tyson Berry gives the Oilers a different dimension. So I know there's been a lot of uh, focus, again, on the forwards and maybe the Oilers' ability to play better 5-on-5 five five up front. But I like the transition game on the defense. It looks like it's improved as well. Uh, Jack, I know you're going to talk about the forwards here in just a second, but Bob mentioned Tyson Berry. The Oilers power play last year, 29.5%, led the league, set the single highest mark in franchise history. Can they actually get better with Tyson Berry quarterbacking that power play? I think so. I mean, it was the best power play in the league in the last 40 years, but Tyson Berry, and, and I think, I'm not sure even the members of that power play know what they have yet. They're going to start getting used to Tyson Berry as much more of a primary option than Oscar Clefbaum was. First of all, he's a right-handed shot, but second of all, he's got a shot. I mean, he's he's got a real lethal first power play unit shot, and he's used to playing with elite players. I mean, in Colorado, he had Nate McKinnon and Miko Ranton. In Toronto, he had John Tavares and Mitch Marner and Austin Matthews. I mean, they're going to just find out what they have. That's no disrespect to Oscar, yeah. but Tyson Berry's on a different level. We're talking about a 50-point D-man as a lock in any normal season. So that's going to be a major weapon. Up front, Connor McDavid has looked phenomenal. No surprise there. Nugent Hopkins and Cassian are going to go. I think, you know, Bob said it all camp. Dominic Cahoon is a natural fit, at least at the start, probably with Leon Dreisaitl and Kyler Yamamoto. I think Josh Archibald is going to end up playing on the left side to start the year with Kyle Turris. Those two are going to see some time on the PK, which also was very good last year. And yes, a pool Yarvey likely will get a crack as your third line right winger. What today's moves mean to me is that Devin Shore has earned a spot on the Oilers roster and may start the year as the fourth line center. So that's what I'm seeing right now up front. Obviously, Smith and Koskinen in net. You mentioned Yessi Pugliarvi, Bob. Well, what have you seen from him so far? You he know, it's what I see is a guy that looks like he's engaged and smiling and happy to be here. And to me, altitude is often defined by your attitude. So, you know, I, I think he looks, and I think it's got to be stated right now. I'm not convinced that an inexperienced general manager would have handled that situation with Paul Yarvey the way Ken Holland did. And I'm also not convinced that if Acme was still Acme and not part of Wasserman, which is Connor McDavid's uh, representation through Jeff Jackson, I think, I think the agency and the player and the manager all combined to say, let's do this thing over and let's give Paul Yarvey an opportunity. And I'll throw this out there right now. I expect, yes, the Paul Yarvey to be killing penalties. I think the Oilers are going to invest in making him a player. And where he's at at 22, he may be a completely different player by the time he gets to 25, 26. He'll start on the third line, as Jack mentions, with a veteran player like Turris. But none of this happens if the forces around Pugliarvi would have handled this differently. So it could be a real bonus because the Oilers could have ended up making a trade for another similar challenged type player. You know, maybe a guy like Borgstrom, as an example, out of Florida, who I believe to this stage is not signed yet. So... Just throwing that out there right now in Paul A Couple of other things, Tony, and, and it's hard not to be distracted. It's a beautiful day. We're excited. We're in Ford Hall. But things we haven't talked about that, that are going on in the world right now, I think it's going to directly impact the fact that James Neal and Gaetan Haas will likely not be in the lineup opening night. Yeah. So the wingers on a line that I think will be centered by Devin Shore will likely be uh, Tyler Ennis, who we know all about, unfortunately broke his ankle in, in the playoffs last year, and Alex Chason, who I think not only will start the year in the lineup, but also get significant time on that first power play unit and maybe a chance for him to bang in a few early. Bob's made an excellent point throughout camp. Alex Chason was one of those guys that was really going at the time of the shutdown. Then he played very well with Neil and Kara in the playoffs on a fourth line that actually, you know, five on five competed very well with Chicago. So Chason has a chance to get off to an early start. And then Haas and Neil are going to have to work their way in the lineup. That's something I didn't think we'd be saying last year. Yeah. And to me, Bob, that's a good sign. And that's a sign that the depth 
that Dave Tippett and Ken Holland have sought to achieve is finally here. Well, and the other, you know, the other thing Jack's mentioned Shore twice, like Jujar Kara has been placed on waivers today. It's my belief, just talking to various pro scouts over the last couple of years, they, they were always intrigued about uh, Jujar, but there was always a thought, does he have more game to give? Yeah. I'm not sure he's going to get claimed, I, but I, I, if it were me and I was running a team and I lacked a little bit of bite and needed a guy that could PK, to me, Jujar is that guy. So 1.2 cap hit, that is not a killer. Uh, there are some cap lim- implications as to why he may have been potentially exposed. And as Jack mentioned, if they sign short, they're not signing him at 1.2 if Jujar gets claimed. So they'd save a little bit of money in the cap. And I think it's 50-50 that Jujar gets claimed at this stage. And one more thing. Yeah. This isn't the first time we've thought that maybe Jujar Kerr's Edmonton career had, had gone sideways a little bit. He has fought his way back into the lineup, up the lineup before. So he may not be done here. That's the thing people have to understand. Just because you're on waivers doesn't mean your future with the club is kaput. Especially in the world we're living in right now, Jujar Kara may be back. And a decision like that really goes to show what kind of competition is prevalent Absolutely. here at Oilers training and, camp and as the, well. And, and the Dave, cap, Tip, Dave and Tippett the mentioned cap, that. Dave Tippett cap. mentioned that as well during this camp. But let's talk about the competition the Oilers will be facing throughout the 2021 season. In regards to the All-Canadian Division, Jack, how do you see this Oilers team stacking up against their seven, six opponents? Well, it's, it's an interesting dichotomy because on the one hand, you have Edmonton who apparently everyone has forgotten finished with the best record among Canadian teams last year. I mean, everyone's forgotten that. Yeah. The Oilers had the, whatever you want to do, most points, best winning percentage, however you want to stack it up, everyone's focused on the four-game loss to Chicago. Fine. No one's saying that isn't part of the equation. The other part of the equation, however, is Edmonton has to be much better this year, obviously, against Canadian teams. They've been at or below 500 the last three years, and it just it, it can't happen that. I mean, Ottawa has one loss in the city of Edmonton the last 15 years. That can't happen anymore. The Oilers have to do better inside Canada because that's who they're playing this year. So they're going to have to be appreciably above 500 to be a playoff team this year. I certainly think they have the horses to do it. I just think that this division, it's interesting, Bob, as I see it, no great teams during the regular season. I don't buy for a second that forecast that has Toronto win 42 games or something. I don't see it. And I don't see Edmonton winning 42, 43 regular season games. I see a compacted division. I don't see a clear favorite. And you know what? With all the additions Ottawa has made, I don't see a clear cellar dweller anymore. Yeah, to me, uh, you know, Montreal vastly improved their team. Ottawa's certainly added some bite. What I would say about Edmonton's situation is from 2010 to 2016, I don't think a lot of teams got up to play the Oilers. That's why Edmonton took Chicago to the Woodhouse a couple times and really hammered them back in 2011, 2012. But since Connor McDavid in 2016-17 became the best player in the world, every team gets up to play the Oilers now, especially in Canada. Which means if you're on the second of a back-to-back and things like that, maybe maybe the records, a li- it's sort of like back in the day with Boston and the Oilers. The Oilers would always play the Bruins in an afternoon game at the end of a road trip and everyone's, oh, they can never win in Boston. Well, there, you know, it was the fifth game in seven days when they would play there. What's their record in the playoffs against Boston back in 88-90? They never lost a game there. So I'm not saying they're not going to, you know, this current edition of the Oilers isn't going to uh, have some challenges along the way, but I do think that it's changed a little bit. So I expect Edmonton to be one of the four playoff teams. Um, I, I like Jack. I think it's going to be very competitive. It would not surprise me if the top six teams, uh, Tony, were separated by a grand total of 12 points in the standings. And Ottawa is going to be nowhere near as bad as most people think. Tony, you're a city kid. Did you catch that from our acreage growing up, friend? You know, when you grow up in an acreage, it's not a wood shed. It's a wood house. I just wanted to point that out. I believe it might have been a wood shed. But I should have said wood shed. Well, one thing I do know is that we're only two sleeps away from the NHL Let's season go. commencing. Uh, before we sign off on the panel presented by Coventry Homes here, I just want to say congratulations to Jack Michaels for his Cleveland Browns getting their first win in the playoffs since 19. 19- 95, the first day of 1995, when this guy had just broken into his 20s. So a long, do you know who the head coach? Do you know ago. who the head coach was that year, Tony? 1995 of Cleveland. Of Cleveland. You oh, may I have can't. heard of him. You may have heard of him. Bill I, Belichick. I, really? Yes. 1995. Well, it's Jack Michaels, Bob Stoffer, and Tony Barr here signing off for the panel presented by Coventry Homes.